Hello everybody and welcome. I'm Mike Werner and today we're going to be looking at management accounting and introducing cost terms and concepts. You may wonder why we have an entire video de devoted to the word cost, but really cost is a critically important measure for businesses and it can sometimes be misunderstood. There are also many ways to classify cost. For example, production line labor in a factory can be classified as product cost, direct cost, labor cost, variable cost, manufacturing cost, conversion cost, prime cost, relevant cost. So there are many ways to classify cost and to study management accounting or cost accounting, we need to be familiar with all of these. The first thing I'd like to talk about are cost objects. A cost object is anything for which we desire separate cost information. It's the it in how much did it cost. We may want to determine the cost of an activity like repairing equipment or testing, uh, doing quality tests in a factory. We may want to determine the cost of a product like in, for a manufacturer, paper towels or personal computers or automobiles. And, and also we might want to determine the cost of products uh, for a merchandiser as well. We may want to determine the cost of services such as performing surgery or doing some accounting work or doing some legal work or the cost of a project, you know, such as the construction of a bridge or a building, uh, the design of a house or an office building or the development of a software package. We may desire cost information about our business related to a geographic area. For example, how's our business doing in the North Division, the South Division? How's it doing in Florida? How's it doing in North Carolina? How's it doing in Miami? How's it doing in New York? We may also want to determine cost information for a particular location of our business, like the Target store on US 1 and 104th Street in Miami. We may want to determine the cost of operating a particular department, such as a marketing department or an accounting department, the finance department, the production department. So we often wonder how much it cost. And the cost object is the it in how much did it cost. With respect to cost objects, some costs are direct cost and others are indirect cost. A direct cost is the cost that can easily be traced to individual cost objects. The cost may also be called a traceable cost because we can trace the cost to a single cost object. Indirect costs are costs that support more than one cost object. An indirect cost may also be called a common cost because it is common to more than one cost object. Tracing indirect cost to cost objects is impossible. And because it's impossible, we're forced to allocate the indirect cost to cost objects if we want to add the cost to the cost objects at all. To illustrate the difference between direct cost and indirect cost, consider 15 Walmart stores located in the Miami area. Each store has a store manager who's responsible for the day-to-day -day operations of the store. In addition, Walmart has regional managers who are responsible for the operations of stores in their area. If we define each of the 15 stores in Miami as cost objects, the salary of each store manager is a direct cost to his or her store. The salary of the regional manager does not support just one store. Rather, it supports all 15 stores. Therefore, the regional manager's salary is an indirect cost of each cost object. We could redefine what's considered a cost object in our example. Let's say that the cost object this time is the sporting goods department of a particular Walmart store. In that case, the salary of the department manager would be considered a direct cost, but the store manager's salary would be considered an indirect cost because the store manager benefits more than just the sporting goods department. The store manager benefits various other departments in the store. So to recap, direct cost can be traced to cost objects, but indirect cost cannot be traced to cost objects and therefore must be allocated. 
Now it stands to reason that when we trace direct cost to cost objects, the cost is very accurate. It's quite accurate. On the other hand, when we allocate cost to cost objects, such as allocating the indirect cost, it's much less accurate. We try to do our best, but allocation is never as accurate as tracing cost to cost objects. The next thing I'd like to talk about is cost behavior. Cost behavior is the reaction of cost to changes in the level of business activity, or really in the level of any activity. For example, if we look at the cost of operating your car and we say that the activity for the car would be driving it, driving it miles, you know, how many miles do you drive in your car? There are certain costs that react as you drive more miles. As activity increases, the costs go up, the costs increase as well. A good example of this would be the cost of gasoline. The more you drive, the more gasoline you're going to burn, and therefore the cost of the gasoline will go up in total. On the other hand, some of the cost for operating your car stay constant, regardless of how many miles you drive it. For example, the cost of automobile insurance. Once you buy that automobile insurance, you can drive the car pretty much as far as you want. You can drive it as many miles as you want, and the cost in total of the automobile insurance does not change. So fixed costs are costs that remain constant in total regardless of the level of activity. Your car insurance would be a good example of this. You can drive additional miles. The total cost of your car insurance is going to remain constant. Variable costs change in total proportionately with changes in the level of activity. Good example of this would be the, the gasoline for your car. The more miles you drive, the higher the total cost will be for the gasoline. So the cost of gasoline increases as the activity or number of miles increase. Now notice in this slide, I have underlined, I have underlined the words in total. See here? In total. In total. So fixed cost remain constant in total. And if you're making notations about this video, I would note that fixed costs stay constant in total. In fact, the word fixed and the word variable, they're pretty descriptive, right? Something that is fixed usually means it is fixed in place or stationary, non-moving. And with respect to cost behavior, what is fixed, set in place and not moving, is total cost, total cost. Variable also is a, a good descriptive word. It means changing. It varies. It's changing. And the word variable describes variable cost in total. Variable cost in total vary with changes in the level of activity. What we'll see a little bit later, once we have some numbers to lend to an example, we'll discover that fixed costs per unit change as activity changes. As activity increases, fixed costs on a per unit basis decrease. Uh, variable costs. Variable costs change in total proportionately with changes in the level of activity. However, per unit variable costs remain constant. So let's talk about fixed costs for business. So examples of fixed costs in a factory would include factory rent, uh, factory property taxes, factory insurance, and the factory general man manager's salary. Regardless of how many units are produced, the factory rent, property tax, factory insurance, and the salary paid to the general manager of that factory they all stay constant in total, again, regardless of the level of production or level of activity. We can depict fixed cost graphically by placing the activity along the x-axis and the cost along the y-axis. And we see here that fixed cost, the fixed cost is remaining constant regardless of 
the level of activity. So for example, if we have a small factory and the factory rents a building for $3,000 a month, then let's see, 3000 the cost per month would be $3,000, $3,000 right here. And the activity for a factory would be number of units produced. So regardless of the number of units produced, the rent cost will, in total, will be fixed or remain constant throughout the entire range of production activity. Variable cost change in total proportionately with changes in the level of activity. Some good examples of variable cost for a factory would be direct material. The material that's used to make each one of our products. We make more products, more units of activity, more units produced, uh, the cost of the direct material is going to go up. Also, direct manufacturing labor increases as we produce more units. The more units we produce, the more labor cost we are going to have. Looking at this slide, we can graph variable cost. And let's say that we're looking at the factory again. And so on this, the activity would be units produced. And maybe we could produce, say, one unit here, one unit, or produce perhaps a thousand units. And what we see is that as activity changes, the cost of the direct material increases in total. So if we produce one unit, maybe the cost would be, say, $3, $3. But if we produce, say, 1,000 units, the cost would be, say, $3,000. $3,000. So as activity increases, the total cost of the material increases as well. So here we got the $3,000 right out here. Now I'd like to introduce another concept, which is the concept of the relevant range. And I'll introduce it more formally in just a minute. Um, but for now, let me just say that there are situations when activity changes so much that the cost behavior for both fixed and variable cost also changes. For example, the fixed cost associated with the factory rent could decrease to zero if the company produced just one or two units. Let's say, for example, that we have a, a company that makes small wooden mailboxes out of exotic wood and the owner can rent a small building to house the factory for $3,000 per month. If the company intends to make only three mailboxes, the owner probably would not rent a factory to do this. They'd he'd probably just make them at home. On the other hand, if the company is making 300 to 1,000 mailboxes a month, it's difficult to make those at home, and therefore the, the owner of the business would probably rent the factory building. Now, on the other hand, if our building is only large enough to produce about a thousand mailboxes a month, and it turns out the company needs to produce 2,000 or 3,000 mailboxes per month, the company is going to have to rent another building or maybe more than one other building. So you can't just add on a couple of feet to the uh, existing building you're going to have to rent a whole new building, and then that would bring your production capacity up to the required two or 3,000 units. Continuing our example, if the owner of our mailbox company goes to the lumberyard to purchase wood, he or she would probably ask for a quantity discount. A discount because, you know, it's one business buying from another. So how much of a discount would the owner get? Well, let's say the company is going to make, uh, let's say, about three mailboxes. Three, three mailboxes? you got to be kidding me. You're not going to get any quantity discounts buying wood just to make three little mailboxes. It's just not going to happen. On the other hand, if the owner buys enough wood to make 300 to 1,000 mailboxes, the lumberyard probably would provide a discount. 
Now, what would happen if the company was making so many mailboxes? So instead of a thousand, they're making two or three thousand mailboxes. And remember, this is exotic wood and it has limited supply. So I guess in theory anyway, you could produce so many mailboxes that you would outstrip the normal low cost source of the wood and you'd have to buy it from, you know, secondary, more costly sources. We can depict this situation on some charts. And you see uh, for rent cost, it is fixed, uh, but at very low levels, it, it drops down to zero. You see here? So if you only make a few mailboxes, you're probably not going to rent a factory building at all. On the other hand, when you're making, say, uh, 300 to 1,000 mailboxes, then uh, you're going to go ahead and rent the building for $3,000 a month. Now, if you're going to make 2,000 or 3,000 mailboxes, you're going to need more space. So you're going to probably rent another building or perhaps two more buildings to house uh, additional factory space to make the additional mailboxes. So what we see is fixed cost, really, in the bigger picture, it, it does vary, does vary, you see. Now, our normal range for this company is right in here, the area shaded in gray. This company, the small mailbox company, generally is going to produce between 300 mailboxes and 1,000 mailboxes. That's it. They're probably not going to produce just one or two mailboxes. They're probably not going to produce thousands. Now let's talk about variable cost, the variable cost of the wood. If the company buys just enough wood to make one or two mailboxes, look how steep this cost line is. It's very steep. But as they buy more wood and quantity discounts kick in, you see the line flattens. And it looks like about here, the company is getting the maximum quantity discount from the lumber yard. And that pricing, that cost, stays pretty much constant all the way up to this area here, up to about a thousand mailboxes. Then if the company needs enough wood to make, you know, thousands of mailboxes perhaps, they will outstrip the supply of our lumber company and they will perhaps have to go to secondary suppliers. And you see here, the cost starts to get steeper again. So as you buy more, uh, you may have to pay a premium price. Now, this is probably not going to happen in most manufacturing situations. It's not going to certainly not happen happening with a company making little mailboxes. Are you kidding me? But I mention it because from an economic standpoint, uh, this is in theory a possibility, a possibility. So the normal range of activity shaded in gray, we see that the variable cost line is linear and variable cost behave as we anticipated. And also the fixed cost within the shaded area, the normal range of activity, the fixed cost is linear and behaves as we anticipated. So this range of activity that I drew, it's actually called the relevant range. In accounting, we call it the relevant range. So the relevant range has a two-part description. First of all, it's the range of activity within which our cost behavior assumptions are valid. That is, fixed and variable costs are linear and behave as expected. Further, the relevant range is the normal expected range of activity for the business. With our mailbox company, it's that range of production activity, which is like 300 to 1,000 mailboxes, our normal operating range. So the relevant range then would be the range within which our cost behavior assumptions are valid, and it's, and it's typically the normal operating range for the company. Now, as you're dealing with different situations, you may wonder, oh boy, are we exceeding the relevant range? Well, you got to be careful with this because if you are constantly raising the relevant range flag, people are going to think that you're crazy because most of the time businesses are not exceeding their relevant range but are operating within the relevant range. 
unless there's some evidence to suggest that you have exceeded your relevant range or you're outside your relevant range, you probably are within the relevant range. So just to recap, here are our charts and we see the fixed cost in the normal range of activity. This time I've labeled that this is the uh, relevant range. It's called the relevant range in management accounting. And within the relevant range, uh, we see that the fixed cost behave as we anticipated they would. And the variable cost does as well. The variable cost for the direct material is linear and the cost per unit would be constant. Now with respect to cost behavior, you got to be careful when it comes to total cost and cost per unit. Fixed cost in total remain constant, but fixed cost per unit decrease as activity increases. For example, with our birdhouse company, if they produce just one unit, we could take the $3,000 in factory rent, divide it by one unit, and what we get is $3,000 per unit per birdhouse for the rent. On the other hand, if they produce a thousand units, we get the $3,000 in rent cost. Divide by 1,000 units, and that equals $3 per uh, unit. Now, by the same token, with respect to variable cost, if the company produces one unit, one mailbox, then the direct material cost will be $3. And $3 divided by that one unit would be a per unit cost of $3. Okay. On the other hand, if they produce 3,000 mailboxes, their direct material cost is going to be $3,000 and uh, they divide by the 1,000 mailboxes and the variable cost per unit for the direct material will be the $3 per unit. So what we see is variable cost per unit remain constant, but variable cost in total changes as activity changes. On the other hand, fixed cost remain co remains constant in total, but decreases per unit as production increases or activity increases. If somebody asks you whether a cost is fixed or variable, and they tell you that the cost does not change, it stays constant, you've got to ask them, well, is it constant on a per unit basis? In that case, it's variable. Or is it constant on a uh, total cost basis? In that case, it is fixed. I should point out, after covering fixed and variable cost, and previously covering direct and indirect cost, that you don't want to confuse these two. Because a, a fixed cost can be either direct or indirect, and a variable cost can be either direct or indirect. And direct cost can be either fixed or variable. Indirect cost can be either fixed or variable. So don't make the mistake of thinking that variable costs are always direct and fixed costs are indirect because that's just not the case. You could have a situation, let's say a Walmart store, where you've got rent on the store, on that particular store. That would be a direct cost. And since it's rent on the store, if we characterize the activity as sales volume, it's also a fixed cost. On the other hand, if we look at the cost of the products being sold in that store, the cost of the products would be a direct cost of each individual store, but it's variable. As they sell more products, the cost goes up. Don't make the mistake of confusing these two very different areas. Next thing I want to talk about is product cost, sometimes called inventoryable cost. Product cost includes the invoice cost of products, the cost of making those products available and ready to sell. For a bookstore, 
This would include the cost of uh, the books themselves, the freight to get the books into the store, also called freight in, and it would also include any cost to get those books ready to sell, such as packaging or any anything that they've got to do to get them ready to sell. Now, for a, a bookstore, generally, the books are ready to go, and there's nothing that needs to be done with them. But if there was something to be done, that cost would be part of product cost. Product cost is also known as inventoriable cost because the way it works is the cost is incurred, it first goes into inventory and is expensed once it's sold. It's expensed as cost of goods sold once it is sold. So product cost is called inventoriable cost because it goes into inventory, appears on the balance sheet until it's sold. And once it's sold, it is taken out of inventory, off the balance sheet, and becomes part of cost of goods sold on the income statement. So again, product cost includes the invoice cost of the product, freight to bring the product to our place of business, also called freight in, and the cost to get the product ready to sell, such as adding packaging or other modifications to get the products ready. Purchase returns and allowances, along with purchase discounts, are subtracted from product cost. So for example, let's say that a shoe store buys uh, $10,000 worth of shoes. The invoice cost is $10,000. That would be included as a product cost. The freight in to bring them into our place of business is $200. That would also be included as a product cost. And then these shoes arrive in these little plastic bags and, and they're fancy shoes, so we really want to showcase them and make them look good. Uh, so we put them in it's really nice boxes. And the cost of the boxes and getting them into the boxes is $1,000. So cost of the boxes and putting them into the boxes would be included as a product cost. And here it is, $1,000. So the total product cost for the shoes would be $11,200. Now, we've been talking about shoe stores and bookstores and so forth, and these companies are merchandisers. That is, they buy product that's basically ready to resell. Uh, merchandisers include both retailers and wholesalers. Uh, wholesalers sell to other companies that will then retail the product, generally speaking, and retailers sell product to the ultimate consumer. So anyway, the inventory for this type of company would be called merchandise inventory. So the inventory classification for merchandisers would be merchandise inventory. However, usually merchandisers only have one classification for inventory. There's only one classification. So sometimes instead of calling it merchandise inventory, they will simply refer to it as inventory. Now let's explore how product cost flows through a merchandising firm. And I've already mentioned this, but uh, this is a more formal depiction of it. We see that we've got the invoice cost of the product here. And that cost is put into merchandise inventory, sometimes just called inventory. And then we've got the freight in, the cost to bring this product into our place of business, that would also be included. We put that cost into the merchandise inventory account. And then we have any of the cost to get the product ready to sell, such as the boxes in our shoe store example. And that cost too would become part of our merchandise inventory. Now, once the product is sold, once the product is sold, let me see if I can write this here, sold. Once the product is sold, we take it out of inventory and we transfer the cost to cost of goods sold, which appears on the income statement as an expense. So once the product is sold, it becomes part of cost of goods sold. It's taken out of inventory. For the product that it remains unsold at the end of the period, it is left in the inventory. It becomes part of our ending merchandise inventory, and it would appear on the balance sheet, on the balance sheet. So for goods that are not sold, 
they would appear on the balance sheet in merchandise inventory, goods that are sold, goods that are sold, their cost would appear on the income statement as part of cost of goods sold. Now here's a very simple calculation to determine cost of goods sold. You've probably seen this before. If you ever studied financial accounting or you studied uh, management accounting in, in college or you're studying it now perhaps, you may have seen this little format. So to determine cost of goods sold, what we do is we take the beginning inventory, in this case it's $23,000, and then we add to that the purchases during the year. So any purchases that were made, we add to the beginning inventory. And then uh, if we add these two amounts together, we arrive at goods available for sale. Then to figure how much we have sold, we can determine this by subtracting our ending inventory. If we have goods available for sale of 323,000 and we've only got 30,000 left, we must have sold all the rest of it. At least in theory, we sold all the rest of it. So cost of goods sold would be $293,000. Notice on this side of the slide, I'm indicating here that we're gonna add in purchases to arrive at goods available and then subtract ending inventory to arrive at the amount of the inventory we have used up in this case it's cost of goods sold this little format this little format can be used to determine how much of any inventory you used whether it be gasoline or supplies or uh, you know your merchandise inventory so it's a good idea to bear it in mind where you know, let's take another look. We start with the beginning inventory, and usually the beginning inventory is last year's ending inventory. So the beginning inventory is last year's ending inventory, see 2018. The amount we purchase in 2019 is added in, giving us cost of goods available for sale. We're going to subtract the ending inventory to get cost of goods sold. Now, the reason I'm emphasizing this a bit is that for a merchandising company, they only have one inventory, merchandise inventory. So this calculation only happens once. It only happens when we calculate cost of goods sold, right? In a few minutes, we're going to be talking about manufacturers. And manufacturers have not one, but three classifications for inventory based on how near the products are to being ready to sell. And if they've got the three classifications of inventory, we've got to know how to do this calculation three times. We're going to be doing this calculation three times for each one of their inventories, for raw material inventory, for work and process inventory, and for finished goods inventory. So it's a good idea. If we know how to do this calculation, we learn how to do it now, so that when we get into the somewhat more complicated accounting for a manufacturer, we'll be able to follow it and it'll be easier for us to understand. We've been talking about product cost, cost of our products, bringing them into our place of business and getting them ready to sell. Now we're going to talk about period cost. Well, what are period cost? Period cost are all the costs that are not product costs. I know that that's a pretty lame description, so let me move on and talk about this a little bit more. Period cost generally includes selling an administrative expense, but does not include the cost associated with acquiring our product or getting it ready to sell. So period cost would include the cost of employees in the marketing department, advertising, sales, accounting, finance, and certain executives. It would also include rent on our stores. That's a sort of a selling expense, advertising cost, and the like. So any cost for a merchandiser, aside from the cost of acquiring its products and getting them ready to sell, would be part of period cost. Now, why do we call it period cost? Well, period costs are expensed in the period they're incurred. So unlike product costs that are put into inventory and expensed as the products are sold, period costs 
go directly to the income statement as expenses in the period incurred. So there's a big difference from an accounting standpoint and that makes it important for us. So let's talk about some of the important components of period cost. First, there's selling cost. Selling cost includes the cost of locating customers, attracting them to our place of business, convincing them to buy, and uh, also the cost of delivering the product to the customer and any paperwork to document the sale. Examples of selling costs include salaries paid to the sales force, uh, sales commission, advertising, and the like. Now, two selling costs are a little less obvious than the ones I just mentioned. One is the cost of delivering product to the customer. That would be freight out. Not to be confused with freight in. This is freight out, uh, shipping the goods from our place of business to our customer. This is considered a selling expense. Why? Because we probably would not pay for the freight if we didn't have to. We're paying for the freight to make our products more attractive to our customers. Another cost that's a selling expense is the cost of storing the product that is ready to sell, keeping it in our warehouse. Now you might think, oh no, that's a product cost. Not necessarily, no. The cost of storing our products in-house ready to sell is a selling expense. And the reason is that storing these products on hand enhances their sales potential. If we've got the product in stock, we're probably going to sell it. If we don't have it in stock, good chance we're not going to sell it. So the cost of storing the merchandise is part of selling expense. Are you ready for another lame description? Now let's talk about administrative cost. Administrative cost includes all costs that are not product cost or selling cost. <laughs> oh my God. Well, let me describe it a little bit further. Generally, businesses, especially merchandising companies and manufacturers, the way they make their money is to acquire products, get those products ready to sell, and sell them. So that's how it's making the money. They're buying products, selling products, buying products, selling products. But you have to have some administrative support to run the company. In other words, if we've got people doing the buying of the product and the selling of the product, what about the accounting? Who's going to do that? Or the finance? You've got to have support departments to support our main business operations. And so administrative costs would include those support functions. Functions like accounting and finance and information technology, human resources, and, and certain executive functions. So these administrative functions support the main business operations and the main business operations, how the company earns its keep would be the product cost and the selling expense. So just to sort of recap here, period cost, all the cost except for product cost. It includes selling expense and then the support functions, the administrative expense. And period costs are expensed as incurred. So they appear on the income statement as selling an administrative expense right there on the income statement in the period when the cost is incurred. Very different from product cost, which is first placed in inventory and then only expensed as cost of goods sold once the goods are sold to the customer. So now that we've examined the product cost and the period cost for a merchandiser, let's take a look at their income statement. I'm going to start by showing you the cost of goods sold schedule again. We see here we've got the cost of goods sold schedule arriving at the cost of goods sold. And the reason I'm showing you this is because we need the cost of goods sold in order to prepare the income statement. So we see that really we take the cost of goods sold from the cost of goods sold schedule and we bring it right down here to the income statement. So we bring the cost of goods sold right down here to the income statement. 
uh, sometimes this whole section, this whole section of the cost of goods sold schedule is included in an income statement. But you don't have to put the whole schedule in there. Instead, you could have a separate schedule calculating cost of goods sold and then just enter the cost of goods sold on the income statement. So here we go. We've got the name of the company. It's an income statement and it's for the year ended December 31st, 2019. We begin with sales, less cost of goods sold, arriving at gross profit, and then we subtract our operating expenses, which are selling expenses of 120 and administrative expenses of 80. The total operating expenses are 200,000. We subtract the 200,000 in operating expenses from the gross profit and we end up with an operating income of $180,000. So there you have it. In this video, we have really covered a lot. Uh, we started off looking at cost objects, direct cost, indirect cost. We looked at uh, cost behavior. We looked at product cost for a merchandiser. We looked at period cost, and we've looked at the cost of goods sold schedule and the income statement as well. So with this, it brings us to the end of Cost Terms and Concepts, Part 1. I'd like to thank you for tuning in, and if you found this video informative or helpful, please give it a thumbs up. So this is Mike Werner from Miami saying bye for now, and I'll see you in the next video.